les doy la más cordial bienvenida a esta actividad del proyecto Connected Worlds, The Caribbean Origin of the Modern World y de la red de estudios transareales y transculturales de Centroamérica y el Caribe. El proyecto Connect Caribbean es un proyecto um, financiado principalmente por la Unión Europea que reúne 14 universidades y una editorial del Caribe, América Latina y Europa y se dedica a estudiar de forma comparada las sociedades caribeñas. La red Transcaribe es una red de investigadores de varias disciplinas eh, que también tiene como eh, eh, énfasis principal estudios caribeños, especialmente los procesos de transculturación y conexiones entre Centroamérica y el Caribe eh, desde el siglo XVI hasta la actualidad. Reúne investigadores de tanto de eh, universidades nacionales de Costa Rica como de América Latina, Europa, Estados Unidos y Canadá. Tanto el proyecto Connect Caribbean como eh, la red Transcaribe son proyectos eh, que tienen su base en el Centro de Investigaciones Históricas de América Central de la Universidad de, de Costa Rica, desde donde eh, eh, transmitimos esta actividad. Además, esta actividad se realiza en cooperación con el posgrado eh, en Historia y la Escuela de Historia de la Universidad de Costa Rica. Me alegra mucho que hoy nos acompaña como conferencista la doctora Miriam Moise de Martinica. Miriam es profesora asociada de Gender and Cultural Studies de la Université de Antilles en Martinique. Eh, también es secretaria general de Universities Caribbean, la organización de universidades e eh, institutos de investigación del Caribe. Tiene un doctorado en estudios anglófonos de la Université Sorbonne en París y un PhD en Literatures in English de la University, University of the West Indies. Sus campos de investigación incluyen principalmente estudios de género, estudios culturales y análisis del discurso, con un enfoque especial en el estudio de la mujer, de las mujeres caribeñas afrodescendientes. Um, tuvo varios, uh, varios fellowships de diferentes organismos, entre estas, estos, la New York University, la Brown University, el University College London y muy recientemente de un fellowship Fulbright de Emory University este año. Su más reciente publicación es la colección Border Transgression and Reconfiguration of Caribbean Spaces, coeditada uh, con Fred Reno uh, y uh, publicada este año, en el 2020. Actualmente está uh, comprometido y colaborando en diferentes uh, actividades de investigación y muy en particular en este programa que mencioné al inicio programa Connect Caribbean. Es también eh, miembro ejecutivo del Caribbean Studies Association y también consultora eh, francesa del Caribbean Examination Council en Barbados, entre otras funciones y actividades que está realizando. Hoy Miriam nos va a hablar sobre el tema Global Caribbean Spaces Black Women's Body Politics Beyond Borders. Esta conferencia va a ser en inglés, aunque eh, quiero decir que Miriam lo sé muy bien porque eh, la escuché varias veces, habla muy bien en español, pero por el momento no se atreve a eh, pronunciar, presentar una conferencia completa en español. Tal vez el próximo año la tendremos, tengamos de regreso ya con una conferencia en español, eh, pero sí, Uh, pueden uh, hacer sus preguntas para después de la conferencia en español y si hay problema podemos traducir también algunas cosas si se uh, presentan algunos problemas. 
Además, eh, Miriam va a eh, basarse también en una presentación eh, PowerPoint eh, que va a ayudar para poder seguir en, en su conferencia. Entonces, welcome, Miriam. It's your turn. I will stop uh, sharing screen so you can share screen. Muchas gracias, Ben. Uh, uh, lo siento, mi nivel de español no es universitario, uh, pero uh, lo entiendo. Uh, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. And this is where my Spanish will stop. I will start speaking English and sharing my presentation. Sorry. Okay, right. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Werner, for organizing it. And uh, uh, I was supposed to be um, at your university in Costa Rica. Uh, so it is, in fact, my pleasure to at least share uh, virtually this conference until we, we meet uh, uh, whenever we meet again, whenever I come to, to Costa Rica. And hopefully, as you said, I will be able to deliver my conferences in, in Spanish by then. So my conference today is, um, is part of a wider research project, which focuses on the representations of the black female body across the Americas. Uh, what, I'm, what I am trying to explore uh, and, and to understand is the extent to which art and creative discourse facilitate the shaping of new transcultural subjectivities and alternative social, cultural, and political considerations on a race and gendered corporeality beyond historical trauma and beyond uh, imperial epistemology, uh, as well as above all beyond geographical borders. So um, indeed, with a focus, uh, my focus is really on text and cultures. Um, so literary creations and artistic creations with a focus on sculptures. I argue that the exploration of artistic, literary, and social cultural representations of the Black female body by women artists and writers of the African diaspora themselves will ultimately allow a deeper understanding of the extent to which these material and textual productions intersect and resonate um, and, and basically participate in uh, these gender constructions across the global Caribbean. Um, when I mention the global Caribbean, uh, I conceptualize it as part of the Black Americas. The concept of Black Americas uh, was inaugurated in 1967 by French anthropologist uh, Roger Bastide in Les Amériques Noires, the Black Americas. And uh, further, it was expanded by Denis Couché, who sees the term as, I quote, designating the entire new world culturally marked by the massive presence of African slaves and their descendants whether in North America, Central America, South America, or the archipelago of the Caribbean, the same historical heritage, slavery, and the plantation system. So this definition is particularly useful to, to frame the contours of, of my paper today and my vision of the global Caribbean. Indeed, I, be, I believe in the geography of the wider Caribbean region. And I see Caribbean spaces as unlimited. I would refer to the wider Caribbean region as not only the geographical uh, area comprising the Antilles, including the Anglophone, Francophone, uh, um, Hispanic and Dutch territories, but I would also include uh, the coastal zones of countries uh, surrounding the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this would include Central America and the Northern region of South America and the Guianas. So this is a very complex 
vision of the geography of the Caribbean and my research uh, spans over this global Caribbean perspective. And as you see um, in, in the book that uh, I've just uh, edited with uh, Fred Renault uh, in the foreword presented by Carol Boyce Davis, she, she does explain that this is a very particular vision of, ge of the Caribbean geography and uh, she mentions space in this formulation as expensive, space that, uh, that is open and allows intellectual, cultural, and social extensions uh, across the region. Um, so considering the time that is allocated uh, to me for this uh, conference today, I, I want first to, to highlight with you the specificity of a black female body, a body of African descent, and to show how this 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 body um, is represented is historically uh, the, the representations are the same historically across um, the black Americas. Uh, then I will share with you a couple of examples of uh, artists and writers of the global Caribbean, uh, Guyana, uh, Trinidad, um, you know, with a focus on concepts uh, of fragmentation, bodily fatness, and as well as bodily resilience. So I, I want to, um, to start by uh, elaborating on the specificity of the female body of African descent. In fact, in traditional African cosmology, the human body is perceived as a capsule and an integral whole incorporating blood, water, fire, air, soil, all of these symbols are integrated in one capsule in, in, in African cosmology. Uh, contrastingly, if we look at the Eurocentric Christian-based and Puritan-influenced systems of thought, um, the body is usually mostly perceived uh, on physical terms. And in fact, it is seen as purely biological object. According to Western philosophy, the body is a fixed entity and a submissive object to the power of the mind. And in fact, feeling very restricted to this body-mind dichotomy and to the imperfect bodily identity um, of the, which, which were imposed by patriarchal discourses, many European feminist uh, theorists have contrived to resist this fixedness of the conceptual uh, framework of the body and to rethink the female body. And it is clear that the female body cannot, however, be universalized. It cannot be universalized. It has to be thought as a cultural object. And this is what uh, Gross, Elizabeth Gross explains in Volatile Bodies. Um, in fact, my body being, my focus being the uh, black female body, uh, of the female body of African descent, the theories of feminists such as Gayatri Spivak or Lucy Irigare uh, who consider the raced, gendered, and classed bodies uh, through the notion of the lived body, the, experience, the body with an experience, um, all of these theories appear as more relevant to my research. In fact, as Gayatri Spivak puts it, uh, if one thinks of the body as such, there is no possible outline of a body as such. There are thinkings of the systematicity of the body. There are value codings of the body. The body as such cannot be thought. In fact, the body is a result of the tensions, of the experiences, of women's, women's lived experiences and all the cultural meanings around them. Uh, all of those experiences which marked women's bodily uh, uh, um, uh, the relationship with their bodies. As a matter of fact, the black female body must be analyzed uh, within its very specificities. It is not any body. It is the body of African descent is a marked historicized space of conflicts. It is a site of trauma and dehumanization 
through the processes of enslavement, colonialism, and neo-colonialism. In fact, the bodies of enslaved African women have been cruelly exploited, sexually abused, chained, pried open, flayed, and discarded. And all these bodies were exposed to the same severe conditions, working conditions as their male counterparts that they often outnumbered uh, as field hands. As significantly pointed out uh, in the introduction to recovering the black female body, self-representations by African-American women, in slavery, the black female body served as one of the prime technologies of reproduction and commodification. In fact, whether, whether it took place in the cotton fields in Southern United States or in the sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean, the African woman's experience of enslavement has been one of resistance against all forms of oppression and one of bodily and discursive reclamation and reconstruction. Early anthologies that I mentioned here, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave, or a black feminist thought, knowledge, consciousness, and the politics of empowerment. These early anthologies are essential works in en enhancing the specificity of the literature produced at the time, and also the various obstacles encountered by black women in the global world even today in the context of Black Lives Matter, where they are confronted with racism, sexism, and social exclusion. So historically, um, the Black female's body's access to space has long been restricted. It has been controlled by hegemonic forces. And in fact, to represent their body, the, the woman of African descent must defy space she, she must defy the territories that she occupies as it is a repositioning into space that matters. It is what call, Gross calls um, a coherent identity and an ability to manipulate things, including her own body parts in space. And this is in her essays on the politics of the bodies. So to understand how uh, women writers, artists, intellectuals, um, particularly women of African descent in the global Caribbean, to understand how they position themselves with regard to body politics, we need to understand the history behind it and to take into account the, the specific modes of representations, the plurality uh, of modes of representation of the Black female body uh, and all of the intermingling social, cultural, racial, and gendered borders that come with it. In fact, I, I want to focus um, on text and sculptures, whether, whether they are fragments of stone or text. It is truly about measuring how these Black bodily spaces become genuine instruments of renewal of feminine subjectivities beyond normative borders. In fact, within this perspective that I'm developing, it seems that African diasporic women writers, artists, and intellectuals strive to allow their body to exist on the page, in their work, to erupt sometimes in their sculptures. While some authors may um, develop rather unconventional approaches, as I will take a few examples, very unconventional approaches to the Black female body. Others may just want to express it as right, as, as having the right to exist as a Black body against Eurocentric norms of beauty, against all the recurrent gender construction patterns uh, that are uh, sometimes cultural in the global Caribbean. Indeed, what I find really interesting is to look at the extent to which women artists and writers manage to make this Black female body visible 
audible and tangible and to reconstruct and remember it beyond trauma. Um, and how really they, they, they managed to assert the black female body as a political space, as a space of resistance, reclamation and empowerment. As theorized by uh, Gayatri Spivak, Lucy Irigare and Ellen Siu, um, through their concept of écriture féminine, writing the feminine body, the only way to move from one position of objectified servitude to a position of full subjectivity is for women to write the truth of their bodies. And this is really what I want to illustrate by taking a few examples of women, uh, uh, women writers um, writing the truth about their bodies, empowering the Black female body through their work. I wish to start my illustration by um, um, Trinidadian Canadian writer um, M. Norbizi Philip. In fact, Norbizi Philip, uh, and, and I will actually, I will take three examples and I will go one by one, but I will talk about um, Norbizi Philip and her specific strategies to impose a rewriting and writing of the Black female body in her poetry. I will then discuss Jamaican American sculptor Simon Lay, um, who, who has also attracted my attention through uh, sculptures of the body. And I will finish with the Guyanese, Guyanese poet uh, Grace Nichols and her political vision of the fat black female body. So starting with um, starting with Norbizi Philip, um, the the, the, the focus of Norbizi Philip is really on the power of the tongue, the power of discourse, re, the reacquisition of power in the capacity for the black female body to create its own image. Um, so she uses the word image, image as a fundamental process to achieve self assertion. In fact, I quote, the power and threat of the artist, poet, or writer lies in his ability to create new eye mages, eye mages that speak to the, the essential being of the people among whom and for whom the artist creates. So it's really about um, uh, building uh, self-representation and self-re-empowerment. In fact, as uh, Cordella Forbes uh, explains in her study on this image concept. Um, she explains that the notion of image entails a genuine process of self definition and self reconstruction through the discursive memory of the body, one that expresses the interconnection between time, self, and voice, and a, a, a dialectic that may allow self-recovery. So um, in fact, Deleuze, uh, Deleuze argues also that memory is the real name of the relation to oneself or the effect of self by self. In fact, remembering, knowing your history, knowing your past, um, uh, as the, the point of departure to reclaim this body as a specific one. Philippe's text, in fact, um, um, sorry, that was, that was uh, Deleuze's quote. In fact, Philippe's text, uh, and, I, and I mentioned uh, she tries her tongue, her silent softly breaks, it's, it's a poetry, it's a very short poetry volume. Um, and she also has another um, nonfiction text, A Genealogy of Resistance. Uh, all her work, Philip's work, really um, explain the comparable prospects of bodily uh, processes of healing and renewal. So she really dis uses the body as a political object, as a, as, as a positioning uh, matters. What matters is really the positioning. In her prose and poetry work, A Genealogy of Resistance that I quote here, Philip really denounces the dislocation of African Caribbean female bodies. And she depicts bodies 
in search of this cursive recreation, provided that the Black African women's tongues be reclaimed and remembered. In fact, in this excerpt that you see here, she denounces the Black females objectification. It's, it's a political stance. It's really the, 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 the de denouncing of the Black females objectification in the process of enslavement, which took the product of her body and the body's wisdoms. So here you see, she, she really mentions body and place as appearing as intrinsically linked. Uh, they, they, are, they are sometimes space and the body sometimes seem to intermingle in, in, um, in uh, Norbezi Phillips' work. Uh, it really made us think about uh, this notion uh, of the land as feminine, of the, um, the feminine metaphor for landscape, which is often uh, used. Um, so further, um, Norbezi Phillips' poetry is also a poetry of fragmentation. She, she, she writes with fragmented verses. Um, and I'm not quoting a poetry book, Zong, which is even more fragmented, but in um, in, in, in her verses as well as is in, her, in her essays, there, there are always uh, fragmented moment. Here, as you see, far from performing victimhood, the following verses that I'm quoting here highlight some of the rebellious responses from African women to the dispossession of their bodies. This is the depiction of rebellious bodies, bodies that survive beyond trauma and beyond exploitation. In fact, um, in, this, in this excerpt, you can see that body and text are fusing from body and place in the earlier verses. You will see that we move to body and text and then to body becoming text. So it's really about the survival of the body, of the Black female body in particular, uh, and its very capacity to turn, to transform into tongue. So it is actually the survival of the discursive bodies that we, we are actually witnessing through Norbizi Phillips' poetry. In fact, um, bodily reconstruction is um, through this course, all of these notion of bodily reconstruction through this course is, is quite a common pattern in slave narratives by women. In fact, in the history of Mary Prince, the only published narrative by a once enslaved woman in the Caribbean, uh, Prince recounts her strategies to survive and to overcome the hardships through acts of resistance. Among those were the numerous times when she actually recounts taking control over her body, her space and um, her speech by talking back to the owners and colonizers, thus deconstructing the stereotypes about the silenced and passive enslaved African woman. So the story of Mary Prince and the transformation of her bodily pains into voice and text are really embodiments of resistance that we can uh, link to uh, Norbizi Phillips' genealogy of resistance, a genealogy that goes from the enslavement to now, a genealogy of resistance that uh, depicts the, the Black female's utterances and body positioning as being reshaped and being continuously renewing and surviving through discourse um, and reclamation and re-empowerment. Um, in the same way as Norbizi Phillips' poetry, uh, which, is, which links the tongue, the body, and the necessity to reclaim a, a body and a discourse, um, Simone Lay, uh, who is a, an American artist of Jamaican parentage, um, her representations of the Black female body is, is also very disturbing and enhances a similar focus on the resilient bodies, the bodies that resist and survive historical damage and commodification. 
Um, if you look here at the ceramics culture, you will see that um, um, lay depicts the face jugs that were fabricated by the enslaved African-American potters in South Carolina. In fact, uh, she relates this to the image of the subservient mammy. Uh, the, the mammy figure, which is a figure which is very much criticized by Black feminists uh, as, in fact, um, it, it, was, it, it is part of the four stereotypes that Black feminists have depicted. Um, the, the mammy figure being uh, also the, the picture of the one which was uh, until very recently on the Aunt Jemima pancake boxes. So it's, it is really um, this figure that Lay is re-exploiting. Uh, she is linking the bodies and the objects and she enhances the functions of both objects and bodies and re-explores uh, different tropes about beauty, about black woman's beauty. Um, in fact, in our very a more recent work, Brick Lane, which is in, in, in New York, she, um, um, Simon Lay uses uh, again, the, the, the body of the black female uh, and she fuses the human body and, and you see that it is in the middle of the city. So there is a sort of fusion between the body and the architecture around it. Um, it looks as if the body is reclaiming its presence and its visibility in a space where it was often rejected from. So if you look at this culture, uh, when I look at the, the, the hair, the plaits here, um, they are somewhat reminiscent also of the, uh, of the, of the representation of the Venus of Wilden, Willendorf, um, this, this mother a goddess symbol, which is actually a fertility uh, figure. The Venus of Willendorf, or nude woman uh, was her name, was this upper paleolithic figuring found in, in 1908 at Willendorf in Austria. And as you see, her head is, is presented, uh, uh, you know, it looks like braids or maybe a cap. Uh, the patterns are very clear uh, and her feet are missing. So this was probably part of the design. Uh, but again, you see that here from the Paleolithic figurings, uh, there is this focus on the body, uh, which, 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 is, um, which is here quite uh, prominent. So the role of, um, to, to go back to Lay, when we think about the role of the black female artist, writer, intellectual, it's really about re-territorializing spaces, reasserting uh, um, um, the, the presence uh, and, and the right to exist in across spaces, across the Black Americas. Uh, spaces that were previously denied to them uh, and spaces that they want to, um, to, to, to re-territorialize and, and to impose their own norms of beauty. Um, for example, if you if we move to 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 the um, to the um, to the example of um, Guyanese poet Grace Nichols, um, she actually wrote a collection of poetry called the Fat Black Woman's Poems. Um, in fact, Grace Nichols um, uses the the, no, the notion of fatness. She 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 links it to the notion of resilience. Um, this quotation was a, is actually a quotation from, um, from Hilary Beckles, uh, who was explaining how uh, the myth of the, the, um, the representation of the black woman as docile and servile mommy, it was turning upside down this myth of the mommy that I was, uh, um, that I was talking about earlier. So Grace Nichol, um, really she uses her poetry to um, turn upside down this notion of the black mammy depicted as a uh, fat and dark skin uh, um, in, 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 in the ideologies and imaginations of the dominant uh, society. In fact, uh, if we talk about 
African Caribbean women writers uh, and theorists, many of them have struggled to, to deconstruct the racist uh, representations of the Black woman as anti-feminine, uh, as, as a passive and obedient, fat, dark-skinned nanny. And in fact, uh, to quote a few Barbara Christian, Caribbean American feminists, uh, actually subverted the myth of the harmless domestic mammy in her analysis of slave narratives. Uh, and I quote her here when she says, the mammy was a cook, housekeeper, nursemaid, seamstress, always nurturing and caring for her folk. But unlike the white sovereign image of the mammy, she is cunning, prone to poisoning her master and not at all content with her lot. So here again, you see that there is a notion of rebellion and of uh, um, positioning, different type of positioning uh, in terms of uh, body politics here. And Grace Nichols, um, the Guyanese poet that I'm going to, um, to quote now, is definitely deconstructing this mummification uh, process. She is really subverting the historical racial stereotypes. Um, and I want to, to quote this excerpt from, from her, her poem entitled, Thoughts Drifting Through the Fat Black Woman's Head While Having a Full Bubble Bath. The fat black woman that she's depicting here is actually developing activist ideals. And it, it seems that she, she's actually intermingling all of these ideals with her body parts. So the body is really central to the poetry of uh, um, Nichols, Grace Nichols. Oh, how I long to place my foot on the head of anthropology, to swing my breast in the face of history, to scrub my back with the dogma of theology. So it's really about a body taking political stance and positioning against the dominant dogma, against normative history, against given stereotypes. So a body rebelling and taking, taking space, making space, and uh, a body speaking. So it's, it's again the importance of discourse, uh, which is here uh, underlined. So defying the master codes uh, Nicole's poetic voice really imprints the body, uh, the body parts are imprinted on the page. Uh, and there is this imaginary, uh, the, this imagery of the black, uh, the fat black female uh, reflecting, thinking while she's actually soaking in a bubble bath. So there is a sort of mixture of femininity and resistance. Uh, a, a, and this is really this vision of uh, body politics that uh, uh, Grace Nichols is developing. It's really uh, Grace Nichols' bodily poetics. Uh, I would call it the bodily poetics because she really exemplifies the, the urge for uh, African Caribbean women in the diaspora and at home to reposition themselves to, um, to, to the, their urge for special uh, repossession, for re-territorialization and self-reclamation. It is really what um, Andrea Shaw explains as well in her book of the embodiment of disobedience, fat black women's unruly political bodies. It's really about disobedience, about uh, unruliness. And when we think about Black Lives Matter movement being led by Black women, again, this is also the notion of um, the, 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 black, um, the Black female body taking a, taking a stance uh, against a dominant regime. So um, definitely, I am very interested in, in understanding um, this vision of the fat black woman's unruly body, uh, the fact that this fatness, which is, which is definitely going against Eurocentric norms of beauty, this fatness actually represents um, a, a form of resistance. And if we, if we think about mythical representations, uh, women's, uh, for example, if we think about Nani of the Maroons in Jamaica, 
women's breasts and fleshy bottoms are often associated to resilience. Uh, in fact, uh, Nani of the Mar Maroons uh, is an example. In the Caribbean region, fatness is often culturally uh, associated with well-being and generosity. Um, so so the, 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 the cultural meaning of fatness uh, differs when we look at the global Caribbean rather than um, um, Europe. So it is really a given fact that fecundity, breastfeeding were fundamental to enslavers uh, during, during, uh, during enslavement time. And in fact, African women were often described as, and I quote, wombs of iron and gold. So the symbolism of the breast is also very important and recurrent um, in, in, uh, in Grace Nichols' fat uh, Black woman's poetry. Um, and this is also what Andrea Shaw explains in her study, uh, because she, she really described the fat Black woman as a female warrior figure uh, who swings her breast at misrepresentations and who rejects the historical uh, continuum of oppressions um, against women of African descent. So Grace Nichols' poetry um, is, is really very much responding to a form of rejection of discrimination uh, and all discriminatory discourses uh, as she asserts an identity in a very colloquial language of her own. Um, and in fact, at the end of the poem that I quoted earlier, um, she, the, the fat black woman in, in Grace Nichols' poetry, she quotes, uh, but this fat black woman ain't no Jemima, a uh, sure thing, honey, yeah. So in fact, she, she dis differentiates her fat black woman to the Aunt Jemima, uh, which is the stereotype of the mommy. It's also very much a speech around uh, performativity. And uh, this is when we come to the, the theory of performativity of Judith Butler, which is very much um, um, significant when we analyze uh, the, the, the poetry of uh, Grace Nichols. In fact, um, far from being a static and unitary subject, uh, Grace Nichols' bodies are actually embodiments of self-transformation and disturbance. They disturb the normative order. They come to, um, to, to subvert canonical English. And uh, in fact, it is really a series of poems uh, that uh, uh, deconstructs binaries. Uh, all of these poems reject all forms of normative categorization. So um, the, 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 this extract here is also very interesting as a, it's really the number of time that the word fat is represented, is, is repeated. It's really fatness used within an anaphoric pattern, and it is made a central figure throughout the book. So there, this is not, um, Nichols really is really contesting uh, through her poetry, she's contesting the marginalization of uh, non-white, non-male individuals uh, within a Caribbean post-colonial context in particular. Um, so the, the poem, the, the last poem that I want to quote is the poem afterward, uh, where she, she, she quotes, um, she, she, she concludes the collection like this, uh, where she depicts the fat black woman as transcending traumatic stereotypes and as eventually reconstructing her own subjectivity. And one, a subjectivity that embraces fatness, gender, race, and class. Behold now the fat black woman who will come out of the forest when the last of her race is finally and utterly extinguished. The fat black woman will emerge and tremblingly, fearlessly stake her claim again. So you see here there is the, the fat black woman is here a personification of survival against all odds beyond the traumatic erasure 
uh, by her counterparts, of, of her counterparts. And in fact, she still comes out of the forest, she still emerges, and her speech remains audible until the end of the poem. And uh, in fact, when you think about representations across the global Caribbean, uh, the, the, you can find many representations of resilient cultures, resilient women uh, who exist beyond space and time. Uh, if you take uh, Barbados, uh, this is a picture of Mother Sally uh, in, in terms of Afro-Caribbean cultural expression of fertility. She, she would be the, express, the expression of fertility. When you look at this picture of Mother Sally in Barbados, she's always represented with her voluptuous shapes, uh, an exaggerated bosom. She's very much celebrated uh, uh, through uh, the, the positioning, the heads up and the hands on her hips. All of these are positions of defiance against time and against, uh, it's really a political defiance. Uh, I also came across in the Dutch Caribbean, I came across the famous colorful chichis she she that you know in Papimento, she she refers to older women uh, that young people hold on high esteem, very much an African uh, also uh, inherited tradition uh, uh, of respecting the elders. Last but not least, I want to, uh, to show this culture by female artists from Curaçao again, uh, from the Dutch Caribbean, Hortense Brown. And you see again, you have the notion of fatness of the body, resilience of the body. And uh, this reference is very much present in, and you can find sculptures of fat black women across the black Americas. Um, this women's body exists and occupies space with their fatness. And this symbolizes presence and power in space. So in terms of conclusion, I, I want to, to explain that in the global Caribbean, women writers and artists of African descent often develop complex or surprising treatment of corporeality. And in fact, their work um, embody both disturbance to the normative framework and deconstruction of a given space. Any space in the Americas should be prepared to accommodate the fact that body and voice are central and in constant tension with the outside hegemonic world. What is interesting to me are the different strategies that I have discussed. The strategies used by these women artists and writers to represent the black female body and self against all historical misrepresentations as soundless and invisible. And you know, their, their, their capacity to turn silence into productive utterance and to implant the, the female body into public spaces, hence defining new body politics. While the black female body has been an object of pain, humiliation, satirization for a long time. And in fact, reconstruction and self-representation can only occur through a political uh, self-positioning, a, a refusal to censor their bodies, as uh, LNCU was, uh, was saying, by writing herself woman returns to the body which has been more than confiscated from her which has been turned uh, uh which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display uh, write yourself your body must be heard the black female bodies under scrutiny may indeed be in perpetual tension, they, but they are, they are definitely multiple rather than unitary. And um, the, 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 the task of the diasporic African Caribbean women writer and artist really lies in the constant um, deconstruction of hegemonic and imposed phallocentric discourses as a essential aim is, is as uh, Norbizi Philip would put it, to revenge the self uh, broken 
upon the word. It's, it's really about uh, revenging the self and therefore remembering and reconnecting uh, the fragmented selves through the power of discourse and artistic creation. So representing their own female corporeal aesthetics and sharing their, um, their vision of bodily representations may allow the female artist, writer, intellectual of African descent to be considered within a more global perspective and within a discourse which would transcend intersectional oppressions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miriam, for this so interesting conference. Muchas gracias, Miriam, por esta conferencia tan uh, interesante y sugerente. Abrimos el espacio para preguntas y comentarios. No sé si alguien quiere intervenir. No veo todavía. Paola, Paola adelante. Hola, much, eh, mucho gusto. Saludos desde Alemania. <ríe> eh, muchas gracias por tu presentación, súper interesante. Eh, de verdad que me, me alegro no haberme la perdido. Eh, más que todo, yo tenía una pregunta. Las tres ya hallaron. <ríe> eh, me gusta mucho el tema del cuerpo. Yo había empezado a trabajar un poco el cuerpo en una uh, spoken word artist de Costa Rica. No sé si la tienes presente. Se llama Queen Nitzinga. Eh, bueno, porque en realidad a mí también yo trabajo, bueno, me gusta, soy una, me gusta muchísimo Philips, especialmente Song, eh, y he trabajado más que todo la representación de lenguas. Entonces, en mi trabajo sobre el cuerpo, en Queen Nitzinga, me he enfocado en la construcción multidimensional de sentido, como lo que vos estabas también hablando a través de la cuestión oral, la cuestión del cuerpo, la escritura, pero además ella pinta con su sangre menstrual y su producción artística gira en torno al, al tropo de la woman, de la womb y woman. Y esa metáfora, eso es una, se puede rastrear a Debbie Young de Jamaica, Canadá. De hecho, Queen, Queen nace en Costa Rica, pero luego ella pasa una década en, en Ontario, en, en Toronto, me acuerdo, en Canadá. Y ahí conoce a Debbie Young. Y Queen traduce un libro de ella que se llama Blood Clat, que es un, 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 una obra teatral. Y me imagino que de ahí también sale como luego lo que Queen crea con este, este tropo de la mujer vientre. Y me, te quería nada más como preguntar si la conocías y si no, pues dirigirte hacia ella porque creo que se va súper bien con tu análisis. Todo lo que decías de ella, yo decía, pucha, eso está genial para hablar de Queen, que yo... En realidad es un, un área que yo no conozco mucho, los gender studies, entonces me, de verdad que salí súper eh, asombrada. Quizás ese, ese detalle te lo podría, o sea, el, el libro te lo puedo pasar y además tiene las, los dibujos de ella, se llama, ay, soy pésima con los nombres, pero ella tiene una serie de arte con su arte menstrual. En este libro vienen los poemas en español, en inglés y en limón creole. Y a través de toda su poética ves figuras femeninas como Nanny of the Maroons, ya sea dibujada o spoken word, también aparece Sartie Bartman, que creo que iba muy bien con tu análisis del el fat body. Mm. Y todo esto está muy atado con lo que tú dices, bodily politic, politics, o creo que así lo llamaste, ¿verdad? O algo así le dijiste. Eso me parece que sería un, un, un interesante agregado a tu corpus. Super, muchas gracias. Buenísimo. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your comments. Definitely um, uh, in, in my corpus, yeah, I, I do mention in the larger version of this, um, this paper, this conference, I do mention uh, the authentic Vena, Sajid Batman, definitely because of the, uh, the body uh, and you know, the, the, the exploitation of the black female body. And, uh, and I also have a, an overwork that I do on the, on the black feminist um, theories uh, where I deconstruct the different stereotypes uh, that they have identified uh, in, in, in uh, in uh, applied to the American context, but then I apply it to the Caribbean context to show that there are, in fact, these stereotypes still 
uh, on the black female body still being existing here in the Caribbean, in the French Caribbean, in the Anglophone Caribbean. And in fact, when I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm more of a specialist, to be honest, I'm a, I'm a French Caribbean, but I am more of a specialist of the um, Anglophone Caribbean literature. Uh, so in terms of when you have mentioned the um, the menstruation and the period that, yes, and that's definitely when we talk about the body, uh, this is a part that the female body in general and the black female body uh, uh, in particular, because you have mentioned the Jamaican word for menstruation. Um, and, and yes, I also love Zong. Uh, I really, uh, you know, this is, I, I wrote a couple of articles on Zong and yeah. it's, it's deep and very fragmented. And, and I believe that the fluidity that, um, that you, you mentioned, you know, whenever we talk about the blood and the body fluids, is very present in, in Zong as well because it's a fragmented poetry with the water, the sweat, the, uh, the blood, you know, and um, it's, it's very much uh, interesting. And, and I wanted to ask you maybe if you can put into the chat for me the name of the Costa Rican artist because I don't know her. Quinn. Yeah, the best. I mean, um, that's great because even if she's from Costa Rica, mm -hmm. she writes uh, in English a lot so this this edition it's called afrocon okay and uh yeah wait that's that great and and definitely i will i will check that out and uh, uh it is also um a point of entry to to the reclamation of the body that i'm talking about exactly. in my work because uh um and, and now busy philip talks about the displace you know the space between the legs uh, so she talks about this place uh, in in in, uh, in in a in one of her uh, work, and uh, and in fact this is also uh, the fragmentation of the body. She exploits it, um, uh, and and the different parts uh, are are put um, are, are emphasized. So you have the tongue, but of course you have the place between the legs, uh, and and she 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 calls it uh, this place. So um, I'm very glad to to have this exchange with you and maybe we can um we can talk you know yes, we can... for sure for sure <laughs> thank you to costa rica de hecho como dijiste al inicio estaba prevista tu estancia de investigación en ese periodo uh, ah. y es más bien un sustituto parcial de tu estancia aquí esta videoconferencia esperamos uh, tenerte un año aquí en una estancia de investigación para así uh, yeah. um, tener este intercambio más, más rico aún uh, um, en presencia. Pero creo que alguien más uh, quería hablar. Bueno, Amanda, creo, ¿verdad? Uh, well, Amanda well, es Mónica. Ok. Adelante, Amanda. Um, so, thank you, Maria, for this conference. It was really, really um, clarifying. You know, in in something that I know very little about, but I I was wondering um, because you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement and some of the contemporary versions of this trauma and exploitation that you are pointing in in your analysis. Um, I was remembering, for example, the controversy around the logo of Aunt Jemima, the I, I think in last July they changed it. They, they switched the logo because of a press from the Black Lives Matter. And I was I wanted to ask you, um, how do you or are you linking this um, this analysis to contemporary forms of ongoing exploitation and trauma or ongoing uh, processes of um, colonial as uh, colonial oppression? on these bodies. Thank you very much for your question. Um, in fact, um, I agree that the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, of course, I, I, I mentioned it because, it, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, nowadays, it's definitely, a, we have to mention it, uh, especially that it is led and created by Black women. Uh, but of course, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we have to also think about everything around the queer theories, uh, and and this this is complexifying uh, the discussion. But whenever we talk about uh, gender, 
race and class and all of these are actually um, a norm. Uh, you know, this is about going beyond the norms because nowadays, uh, if you think about the Eurocentric norm, then you would you would you would define it as uh, definitely male, uh, a white Caucasian uh, with money, Christian, heterosexual, with no disability. You know, so 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 that means that if you are a woman and you are black, you already have two things. If you are a lesbian, you have a third criteria. And if if you are a Muslim and 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 you have a disability and you have no money, if you are poor, then that means you have all of these intersectional oppressions against you. So yes, I believe that nowadays, more than ever, uh, the discourse around the black female body and uh, um, new body politics is even even more significant now than before. Uh, I, I think that uh, in the Caribbean in particular, depending on the region where you are, you have specificities. Um, in, in, in Martinique, in the French Caribbean where I am, uh, some of the stereotypes that are denounced by the uh, black feminist uh, theorists, uh, some of them are, you know, are still, I believe that they're still uh, existing. For example, uh, you know, the welfare mother, uh, the, the stereotype of the welfare mother, the mother living out of uh, um, um, uh, benefits, social benefits. Uh, we have a term for this here. We have a term for these women here. We have advertising sometimes that come out saying, go and get yourself a training. And it's usually a woman who is a stereotype with long nails and uh, uh, curly uh, pink hair. So, you know, all of these about the hypersexualization as well is very much present in our societies. And I think it is uh, across the, the Americas. So, so I believe that some of the stereotypes are definitely uh, still uh, visible um, in the Caribbean. And um, I believe that the, it's a different fight for black women is a different fight than the fight that, 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 that than the regular feminist white feminist fight, but it is still a fight for uh, justice and for equality of opportunities and also for acceptance in certain um, circles where they are still rejected. And there's also at the moment I'm sure you've seen on um, on the social networks. Um, this uh, this um, this argument, this discussion around the payment of black women uh, in some academic circles, or in you know when they are being invited, then the some institutions would consider that it's already uh, an honor for you to be at the table, so you're not going to be paid um, because before there were no black women at the table, so now there is one, so at least you can be glad to be sitting at the table, but you're not going to be. You know, you don't not, you don't need to ask for a stipend. So, so again, we have this uh, this notion of uh, the black woman always having to be grateful for where we where, where she is because she came from far. Uh, so, so yes, the fight the fight is still on um, for justice for equality and um, body politics definitely very very resonant um, in nowadays con con context. Thank you very much for. For your question, Amanda. Monica, adelante. Oh, sorry. sorry, Monica. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello. Is uh, English, Spanish? I don't know which language I, more people. I, I understand. I understand Spanish. If you don't speak too too fast, but I will not respond in Spanish. Okay. No, I'm, I'm more comfortable in English talking about these themes. Okay. Um, although it's Spanish my first language, but I was wondering. Um, in which language more people will understand. I think, I guess oh. it's the same. Everyone speaks English, right? Um, so, well, thank you very much, Miriam, for your talk. I loved it. And I'd like to thank the organizers as well. Um, I'm glad I could join. It's um, in Spain, it's very late here, but I'm really glad um, to hear this because I um, really loved it. I'm also very excited to be connected with the Caribbean uh, because I'm writing my uh, doctoral thesis on um, from Caribbean writing, um, also diasporic writing. And I'm using uh, the same framework as you do as in the global Caribbean or pan-Caribbean politics of farther beyond nation states, uh, the Caribbean Sea as framework. And well, that's when, uh, well, thank you very much. I wrote, I wrote down all 
the works you recommended, all your work, I'll check it out. I'll, uh, I'll, it will be very useful to me uh, because this is where my question begins. Uh, I found some challenges in using this uh, framework because, well, um, not only because of um, matters of the nation state, but also because in terms of history, some nation states are very different uh, from others. And in particular, the Hispanic Caribbean, also Haiti, but in the Hispanic Caribbean, also in terms of demography uh, too. So um, um, I, I think this framework is useful and it's necessary, uh, but I, I would, like well I feel like I'm constantly justifying the fact that I'm using this framework so I would like to ask you the, the challenges that you've faced and also the the why well, I, I think you said it but maybe you could expand on that why is it important for you to use this framework and I know because of the poly body politics of Afro-Caribbean women but I guess you'll be said um, sometimes I'll tell you that if you're using the frameworks, sometimes those, um, it escapes uh, in terms of the heterogeneity of the Hispanic Caribbean population. Maybe uh, you're just focusing on one part of it. So I, I'm just curious to see um, how you're dealing with this. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, to be honest, this that's a very interesting question. To, to be honest, yes, the heterogeneity of uh, Latin American, I mean, Hispanic uh, part of the global Caribbean complexify things. And uh, um, Connect Caribbean is actually a program that was, you know, that, that I chose to, to embark on because I wanted to, to be able to explore this, um, this heterogeneity that I do not, that I'm not familiar with. And in fact, that's why as, as, a, as when I was saying I have a you know, I, I had I was planned for two months in Costa Rica this year, two months next year. So, so eventually, I think I'll come in twenty at the end of uh, uh, at the beginning of twenty twenty two uh, in January. Uh, but but anyway, the, the my my knowledge of the Hispanic um, global Caribbean Hispanic part is the part that I know the least uh, because I know the French speaking part and the English speaking part. Uh, but the uh, Spanish speaking part is really. Uh, the one that I know the least, and of course, is complexified because of all of the uh, presence of the indigenous, and you know, and and, and I understand that. Um, but I believe that if you if you define your your topic very clearly, and you men, you, you define what you hear, what you understand as African descent, uh, or you know what 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 is behind the word black then you make it clear. Uh, but as, as, a, as, as a graduate from the Sorbonne and University of the West Indies, I can tell you that between Trinidad and Paris, uh, there was a huge gap in terms of theoretical uh, understanding. So, uh, so that's why in my work, I would use you know, um, as African cosmology, but I also use European theorists. Uh, you know, as I as you see, I, I quote I can quote Deleuze, but I uh, you know I I, I quote uh, my my African Caribbean uh, writers. I mean, my 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 framework is very large, and I think it's 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 a it's, it's a wealth to be able to circulate um, and use the theories that you need to use. And in terms of justifying your choice, definitely, I I would say that what makes it more complex as well is the difference between a Caribbean sovereign state and a Caribbean non-sovereign state, because I live in a non-sovereign Caribbean. So that is a neo-colonial uh, Caribbean state. Uh, and, and I study uh, mostly, my, my, my field is more on sovereign Caribbean states. So I think this is where the difference is. And uh, using the black feminist framework, people will always, criticize you for using it whenever they're not because they will say this is for Americans this is not for us you know it's it's not going to apply this is something I hear a lot in my in my work in in France by French scholars of often they would say well this is for you know you are applying an American framework to a French context because the France is a nation which is race blind uh, you know the, the values are really on uh, Republican, uh, universalism. So that means that, you know, they do not, they do not see race, but race is there. 
and uh, at, at some point it, it may blow into their faces. So uh, right now I am I am using it and I'm applying it uh, and it works rather well as long as you justify uh, your framework. I think you can use any any theoretical framework. So don't don't let yourself being restricted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yo también tengo dos preguntas inquietudes. La primera, eh, hablaste en algún momento del black female body como antítesis de lo beautiful, de lo bello. Eh, me pregunto si no, en, en la percepción blanca, especialmente europea, al inicio, después también de, de Norteamérica. Eh, me pregunto, y esto tal vez combina también, se relaciona con la inquietud que tenía Amanda, ¿No está pasando algo también eh, que construya el Black Female Body de, de los Caribes como una alegoría, un símbolo, mejor tal vez una alegoría de la belleza del Caribe, por la sexualización, por la hipersexualización eh, de la que hablaste y por la exotización, eh, siempre en la percepción blanca o europea o Uh, norteamericana y creo que es un, un elemento que tendríamos que tomar, tomar en cuenta especialmente por supuesto uh, a través del turismo también que es una nueva forma tal vez de colonización o de, 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 de persistencia de estructuras uh, coloniales también. Esta es la primera inquietud que tengo, primera pregunta. La segunda se, se refiere a lo que um, explicaste y uh, muy bien, creo yo que el cuerpo no existe como tal, sino es una construcción cultural, social, etcétera, etcétera. Pero me parece interesante que en lo que dijiste sobre la relación entre body and space, eh, hay una construcción social del cuerpo a través de su renaturalización. Eh, y creo que los intentos de relacionar el cuerpo con el texto es un intento de, eh, de naturalización eh, en, en, en estos textos que nos presentaste y tal vez también en, en las eh, esculturas. Eh, Esa es mi inquietud más bien que una pregunta. Y tal vez un, un tercer aspecto que es más bien uh, uh, una sugerencia Uh, hay una artista costarricense y Alzheimer ahora no me permite memorizar su nombre que trabaja con, con cuerpos femeninos gordos. Le da Astorga. ¿Cómo? Le da Astorga. Perfecto, gracias. Le da Astorga, pero no es el cuerpo negro, sino es el cuerpo mestizo, para decirlo de alguna manera. También, también usa, usa negras. Voy a tratar de ponerte un okay. ejemplo en el chat. Sería interesante tomar en cuenta esto también, especialmente preparando tu estancia en Costa Rica para conocer esta ob obra artística de esta artista uh, uh, um, uh, costarricense. Tal vez si, uh, María Lourdes, si puedes compartir un, una imagen, sería tal vez muy sugerente. Sí, esas son mis inquietudes, preguntas. Sí. Um... Estoy buscando una negra, pero ya te subo ya te subo una negra, pero te voy a subir una, una blanca para que tengas, bueno, una mestiza. Te la estoy subiendo por el las chat. Blancas también. Bueno, blanca no. Pero yo tengo un diablo, una diablilla o un angelito negro. Un angelito negro, déjame ver si lo si encuentro. Right. Thank you so much. I'm downloading. Um... I've just downloaded the picture. Oh, okay, great. All right. So, so what's the name of this, uh, this, this, um, this piece? What's the name of the artist? Aquí encontré una negrita preciosa. Una niña. Ella usa de todos los colores. Digamos que no tiene problema. Y ¿Puedes? el nombre, para que lo tengas claro, es Leda Astorga, escultora. Voy, voy a compartir ya eh, pantalla un momento. 
Okay, perfect. I saw it. Okay. Le Leda as Toga. Okay. Excellent. You see it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's great. So you're already giving me food for when I come to Costa Rica. Okay. <laughs> So I can I can uh, I can conduct um, some research on uh, on this. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to respond to to the questions that uh, you have um, you have asked. Uh, when uh, thank you very much for your for your questions and and in fact uh, when you you mentioned hypersexualization, yes, definitely. Uh, when we talk about black female body politics, we would definitely think about. Um, you know, discuss hypersexualization, and this is also one of the four stereotypes that this is, which which are described uh, by, which are denounced by the black feminist uh, theorist. Uh, that the stereotype of the Jezebel, uh, Jezebel, who was uh, the lady in the Bible who actually led um, the servants of uh, Jesus to. Uh, to to um, sexual um, to to do sexual intercourses, um, so uh, sexual deprivation. So Jezebel is really the um, representation of the hypersexualization. But of course, um, some artists some artists are actually using it and turning it upside down because this can also be a way to uh, um, for em empowerment of, of the body as well. Um, because, and, and this will allow me to, to discuss this, this part when you said about, uh, of course we can denounce this uh, exoticism of the black female body, but also the black male body, because when uh, it's also exploited in, in, you know, in, the, in the Caribbean, it's not only the female who, uh, female body who are actually ex ex exoticized in the way that you've mentioned when you talked about uh, uh, tourism, um, sexual tourism, right? So it's for men and women. Uh, but in terms of um, the, the difference between a white female body and a black female body, and you talked about the norms, the beauty, uh, the beauty norms. Yes, uh, it is very much up to date nowadays. For black uh, female, it's often very much questioned uh, whether uh, in some in some institutions or administration, even nowadays, it is questioned the the hair, the kinky hair. I think that the question of the hair. Uh, is is central to the question of the black female body uh, when when we talk about the kinky hair which actually stand up on a, on a head uh, whereas the, uh, the the Caucasian normative uh, version of a white uh, European woman would be to uh, you know to have the hair relaxed and down so uh, we have all of these uh, um, uh, topics and discussions and research around um, the representation of the black female body and their their need uh, to reclaim their body as it is without having to use chemicals to um, to 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 turn their hair into what uh, they are not uh, what it is not. So, so definitely historically, when you talked about whiteness, you would uh, we have this 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 historical framework, normative framework, where whiteness was assimilated uh, to uh, innocence and purity, um, you know, and fragile woman. Uh, whereas the black female, uh, for example, if you look at uh, Michelle Obama, she was described as an angry black woman very straight away. So, so the black woman cannot speak too loud, uh, cannot uh, um, uh, be uh, too expressive because otherwise she will be treated as a, she will be uh, um, um, uh, called an, an angry black woman, which is also another stereotype. So uh, I think that in terms of cultural uh, representations, it is very significant to um, to analyze and compare the notion of white female body and a black female body. And that's why white feminists do not always understand the notion of intersectional oppressions because they do not experience it. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to say is when you mentioned the space, you, you asked me about space and the body, uh, if I understand. And uh, yes, I, I, I use space 
I, I want to use the word space in all of the possibilities. That is to say, um, discursive spaces, physical spaces, geographical spaces. Um, so whenever the body exists into space and uh, positions itself into space, then it is fundamental that we discuss empowerment strategies uh, because, uh, for example, in the Caribbean, except during carnival, which is the time when women would invade the public space, the street, except during this time, uh, women are not uh, using, you know, they are not managing, mastering the public domain. It's best, the street is a male space. The kitchen would be a female space or the garden would be a female space, but the street is very male. And this is when we talk about street harassment and so on as well. So space is very linked to the discussion on the body. Tal vez un comentario adicional, lo que me interesa en mi lectura de la literatura alemana, europea, Es muy interesante que el ideal de belleza femenina construida por el hombre principalmente es el, el, el cuerpo blanco, el cuerpo blanco, delgado, etcétera, etcétera. Esto según mi teoría cambia en la modernidad y tal vez aún más en la postmodernidad porque ya es mucho más exótico no tener ahora tez blanca sino tez morena, ¿no? tal vez ya por el ecologismo ya está cambiando otra vez, pero en mi juventud esto era el ideal de belleza, eh, nuestras fantasías de hombres de la belleza femenina, ya no era el cuerpo blanco, sino es, era un cuerpo moreno eh, con algunas eh, características del cuerpo blanco, delgadez, etcétera, etcétera. Lo que quiero decir, hay cambios también, uh, en, en las formas, no tanto creo que en, en la sustancia de la dominación uh, y control del cuerpo femenino ¿no? a través de un ideal construido. Esto es lo que me preocupa. Yeah, of course, you, of course you, have, you have the other way around. Of course, you have cultural, but this is, this is not the same. This is like cultural reappropriation. Uh, you know, if you, if you take the case of Rachel Dolezal, for example, or, or these, these, these white women who actually wanted to be black, uh, you know, in the, in, in the American context because they wanted to enjoy a, an opportunity. Uh, but we have to be very careful about uh, when we talk about race and when we talk about these shift uh, in the other way around because, um, and, and there is a French, there is a French uh, theorist who wrote a book called uh, in French, pauvre petit blanc, which is poor white people. And, and it, it, it explains how, specifically in the American context, how white Americans truly believe that they are being disadvantaged co compared to, uh, to black people. Uh, and, and when we look at the figures, we realize that definitely uh, the African-American communities are, um, are, are still uh, suffering from the, the the consequences of of uh, of uh, enslavement and and uh, and segregation. So I'm not. Uh, I think I would be careful with, um, of course, the notion of race, which is complex. Uh, but I would be careful with the context as well, uh, the American context, the Caribbean context. Uh, but as you know, when I talk about the global Caribbean. I want to be able to uh, draw connections across the Black Americas. So that's why I go back and forth and I find connections. But of course, it's, it's interesting, but um, it is very complex and based on, you know, we have to be careful about the context uh, that we, we mentioned. And that's why I'm very, I was very interested when Monica mentioned the heterogeneity of, the, um, of, the, uh, of Latin America. Uh, in this respect, uh, that and this, this is a part that that is quite uh, not known to me. And thank you for sending the pictures. In the meantime, I'm downloading. Thank you very much, Maria. Con mucho gusto. Encontré una nueva. Ya te la voy a pasar. Muy linda. Muchas gracias.
No sé si hay más preguntas o comentarios. Yes, I, I, I would just like to comment upon what you've just been thinking about, like um, reappropriation of, let's say, less um, white bodies. In my personal perception, maybe I'm wrong, I think um, this uh, turn to well, what, what what you've been talking about, it's still made from the white imagination, because even when I uh, see um, models or images of Black women as modes, um, examples of beauty, I can see how they cannot be too Black or their hair cannot be too Afro, their, their bodies are curvy but not too much so if if we if we look at these examples we we can still um in um i can't i can't seem to find the word but like to find um characteristics which are characteristics of whiteness defining these bodies i don't know um what you think about that but it's still like just maybe yeah terrible. <laughs> yeah, of course, I see I see what you mean. I mean, Fanon's, France Fanon's uh, alienation, uh, you know, is still theory, is still uh, very much um, applicable in some instances. Um, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, you have the issues of uh, skin bleaching and uh, you have all of these and uh, uh, and to be honest, I, I believe that we, we have this uh, notion of epigenetics as well, like this, the fact that trauma is, is, is inscribed through generations. So sometimes it's also transgenerational um, and, and uh, this notion also, which is very much embedded in, in some of our people's mind, but the, the white superiority is, is sometimes a notion which is already embedded and passed on through generations. So, so this is something that uh, women have to, to move beyond and is the same for the construction of the body as well. Uh, the, the body as being disciplined and, and uh, silenced and, and all of these restrictions of the body uh, are often passed on from mother to daughter. I mean, you know, through generations, so um, so if I understand your 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 question about uh, the white the characteristics the whiteness um, uh, in in uh, you know the fact that some some black women would still uh, try I mean it's also an issue it's a different issue but it's also an issue that that is problematic but is also very much linked to education I would say. Uh, and that's why critical race studies and um, you know gender studies uh, and black feminist studies uh, are important to teach for uh, for young women to be able to to draft to 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 recreate their own body politics um, in this world, which is a complex world, and where they should be able to assert themselves as who they are uh, and make their own choices uh, without. Uh, being disturbed by uh, stereotypical uh, stereotypes being being passed on through generations. Bueno, aquí hay otro ejemplo de Lira Astorga. Oh yeah. Bien, Interesting with the braids, right? She 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 uses like the Rasta Rastafarian. Uh, um, representation as well to some extent, and mm -hmm. the nakedness and and the, and the, and the, uh, the fatness. Definitely, I can use uh, some of these examples and include Costa Rica in my study. Uh, that's very interesting. Is is it is it a a you said that it's a black female artist? No, no, she's she's um, mestiza. Oh, mestiza, yeah. Sí. Okay, it, yeah, is fine. She... But it's a female. It's a woman, yes. right? Eh, okay. siempre, pero siempre toda la obra son gordas. Es decir, no es que ella solo usa, digamos, las ne negras gordas, sino que toda su obra es de gordas, de cualquier color, digamos, pero gordas. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's very interesting. And, um, and she lives in Costa Rica. 
Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. So when I come, I probably can meet her. You can uh, talk to her, of course. Excellent. That's that's great. Organize. Yeah. Thank you. That's that sounds exciting. <laughs> Parece que no hay más comentarios o preguntas. De todas maneras, es importante que, que vengas. Ojalá pronto el próximo año. No sabemos todavía cómo estará mm. la situación el próximo año, pero a lo mejor en la segunda mitad del año uh, será posible. Esperamos que, que sea así. Mm. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, me alegra especialmente que continuamos este intercambio entre Costa Rica y otras partes del mundo también y especialmente el Caribe insular y especialmente el Caribe francófono, además hablando principalmente sobre el Caribe anglófono, desde el Caribe francófono me parece perfecto. De hecho, la, el intercambio con los colegas y las colegas de Martinica ha sido constante en estos años del ya antes de comenzar el proyecto Connect Caribbean, pero hemos continuado esto también en el marco del proyecto Connect Caribbean y vamos a seguir en esto. Muchísimas gracias um, a Miriam, a sí. ustedes, y les deseo unas felices fiestas, lindas vacaciones y todo lo mejor para el próximo año.